Thank you, Einar, and uh, good morning, everyone. I now have the pleasure to shortly introduce Professor Dave Jobs. He is a psychology professor, and he's also an, an associate director of clinical training at the Catholic University of America in Washington, DC. He is considered to be one of the world's leading suicidologist, and he is also a past president of the American Association of Suicidology. Throughout the last 25 years, he has developed what he calls collaborative assessment and management of suicidality camps. And now we look very much forward to hearing your presentation, so welcome. So good morning. Good morning. Good morning. I'm the one that just got off the plane, so. Um, I am delighted to be here. This is, I think, my fourth visit to Oslo, uh, Norway, your beautiful country. I'm always happy to be here. Uh, Scandinavia, especially Denmark, has been a, a real um, a center for doing work in CAMS, and you're gonna hear about that a little bit this afternoon and throughout this morning. Um, what I want to do is walk you through three 45-minute segments um, that will march us through innovations broadly in the field um, and then a, a shift looking at the CAMS model as an alternative to sort of standard practice. Uh, and hopefully with this you'll have sort of a, a, both a diverse and then sort of in-depth look at this topic, um, at least from my perspective. Uh, I'm a professor at Catholic University. Our school week started just last year. That's why my, brief, my visit here is brief. Um, but I, again, I'm thrilled to be here um, to talk to you on this topic. So um, at least in the States, we always have to talk about our potential influences uh, that may bias what we have to say. So I, I get grant funding from the National Institutes of Mental Health um, and from the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention. I'm a treatment researcher, and you're going to hear about that research momentarily, um, but those funds uh, do support the work that we do. I also do process improvement. So um, an area of expertise of mine as a clinician um, is, a, is to train and go into environments, systems of care, frankly, when there's been a suicide or a lawsuit oftentimes, to try to intervene with that system and raise the standard of care across the, that system and those providers. So it's a very interesting perspective, uh, looking at medical records, looking at standard operating procedures, the different things that go into how a system operates with regard to suicide risk. Uh, I've got some books, so I get book royalties. I'm a co-owner of a training company, and I do research with our military and our VA, and so I don't speak for my government, especially since the election. Um, I, <laughs> Definitely don't speak for my government, um, and that's enough of that. So um, I, I'm uh, 59. I just had a birthday a few weeks ago. I have been in this field since graduate school, and I'm of, a, of an age in a cohort where I had the good fortune of meeting, at least on the United States side of things, the founding fathers, um, and have grown up over 34 years working in this field. And so um, this is me, looking exactly the same. Um, <laughs> um, back in 1984, at my first American Association of Suicidology Conference, this is my mentor, Dr. Lanny Berman, who was my major professor. Lanny um, was the executive director of AAS for a number of years, and he introduced me to a number of people in the field, um, like Robert, Robert Lippmann. So back in the States, the Los Angeles Suicide Prevention Center is sort of the birthplace of uh, the contemporary study of suicide in the U.S. Along with uh, Norman Farborough, um, they um, were the ones that really put hotlines, crisis hotlines. Now the Samaritans in the U.K. were obviously doing things early on, but uh, in the States, the, the hotline systems that we know and think of today were really sort of the birthplace that was uh, at the Los Angeles Suicide Prevention Center. Um, I uh, was, had the good fortune of knowing Dr. Jerry Motto, uh, and I'll talk a little bit about Jerry's work later. Um, uh, he was a psychiatrist working in the Bay Area, very famous for his Caring Letters research. Uh, 
Um, and then a major influence was Dr. Ed Schneiman. So Schneiman was the founder of AAS, the, founder, uh, the, the founding editor of Suicide and Life-Threatening Behavior, and the inventor of many terms um, that we now commonly use, like suicidology. Um, so I, I, I'm doing this to impress you a little bit, but um, you know, to, to say that I, I, I you know, grew up at the knee of a lot of people that were sort of turning this field, turning the switch on, so to speak, in the late 1950s, early 1960s, to thinking about the psychological, psychiatric study of suicide in a systematic way. And along the way, uh, I've gotten to work with Dr. Aaron Beck, the founder of Cognitive Therapy in his lab at the University of Pennsylvania. I've been heavily influenced by other key colleagues. This is uh, John Malzberger, who died about a year ago, a professor at Harvard. Um, Malzberger, in 1974, was one of the first to say that clinicians have strong negative feelings towards suicidal patients. Uh, that was a big deal in 1974. His paper in the Archives of General Psychiatry, Countertransference, the Suicidal Patient, Countertransferential Hate, and the Suicidal Patient, is really one of the seminal papers in the field um, and informs a lot of what we commonly now uh, think of as the struggles that clinicians have with, um, these, um, with these patients. And I'll, I'll certainly speak to that as we go. Another major influence was Israel Orbach. Uh, Israel was a, a psychologist in Israel and a, a, a great humanist, um, a person who was very thoughtful as a clinician, um, worked with children and adolescents, made uh, seminal research contributions. And then another um, big influence has been Marshall Linehan. So Marshall Linehan is the developer of dialectical behavior therapy, um, and we're going to talk a lot about her work. And she's really been um, a major mentor to me in the research that I do. I never meant to be a treatment researcher. Um, she basically shamed me into it. So um, I'm very grateful to her. And of course, as an American, I think the, the world revolves around America. Of course, it doesn't. Um, there are very thoughtful people around the globe. This is Keith Houghton, um, who's a very prominent suicidologist uh, in the UK at Oxford and, um, and throughout um, Europe. So um, these are just a, a few of the folks that have shaped and sort of uh, given me some of my early um, impressions on the field. And, and why it's important is that when I first came into this field, we had some very um, uh, pedestrian, sort of um, simple ways of thinking about things. For example, psychological autopsies uh, of completed suicides were very hot at the time. And what they were revealing was that psychopathology is significantly implicated in suicides. And that uh, that sort of perspective has dominated um, the field of suicide prevention ever since. So we, we've, when, when you look at the psychiatric mental health literature, it's a literature dominated by mental disorders, mental diseases, the symptoms of mental disorders. Um, and we're going to talk about that because millions of people have these mental disorders and don't kill themselves. Right? And so depression does not equal suicide, not even remotely. So you have sensitivity and specificity issues around psychopathology, and so one of the themes of today's conference is to look at the proper role of psychopathology, what it does do for us to some extent, and then what it doesn't do for us clinically if we want to save lives. So that's one of the things that we'll be talking about as we go. The epidemiology of suicide and suicidal behaviors were very hot back in the early 1980s when I first came into this field. Youth suicide became a major focus. There was the birth of the lost survivor movement. These were mostly parents who lost their children. Um, and in the States and, and around the world, <coughs> lost survivors had become leaders in the field of suicide prevention. In the States, uh, we have a national strategy now in its second version largely because two parents who lost their daughter made our government pay, pay attention to this topic. Um, it wasn't the researchers, it wasn't the academics, it wasn't the clinicians, it was parents who put this issue on the map. And so we're very grateful to that uh, movement. It still remains very active today. Now, when I first was in the field, I worked as a psych tech, so that I worked on a nursing staff, an inpatient psychiatric unit. And back in those days, uh, it was not uncommon for patients to be hospitalized for months on end. Six months would not be a short stay. 
Um, in my country now, the average length of stay in an inpatient psychiatric hospital is about six days. So we've moved from multi-month stays now to day, stays that are in a matter of days. And the treatment um, is not very suicide specific. And so that's a big deal because this was a, a comfortable model for a lot of us. Um, I certainly thought it was effective and I enjoyed working within that world. But now if you were to hospitalize, and I haven't hospitalized a patient probably in 15, 20 years, but now if I were to hospitalize a patient in the States, I, I would probably get a call the next day about disposition discharge. And the, the arguments that we're gonna be looking at is that this hospital stay now has maybe perhaps made matters worse versus helping because there's not really any treatment outside prescribing medications. And many of the medications that many of our patients take, don't, the SSRIs, for example, don't kick in for 10, 20 days. So medications alone actually have very little evidence in supporting treating suicidal risk. So we have to think about that and what we're doing by these hospital stays. There's a way to make hospital stays effective, but it's gonna be a little bit more expensive. And of course, that is a big issue in contemporary care in the States and around the world. And then there was this sort of wacky notion of people getting, uh, clinicians getting patients to promise not to kill themselves. No harm contracts, no suicide contracts. I'm sorry to say this is still widely seen and done in the States. I'm not sure about the rest of the world. I'm seeing some nodding heads. But the idea of getting a patient to promise what they won't do makes no sense. What do they do should they get in a desperate moment uh, in a highly acute suicidal state? That, that should be our focus, so we'll talk about that as we go. In any event, this is what was really hot when I was first in the field. Today, things have really taken off. And I think in the last five years, the field of suicidology, of suicide prevention, has matured and has grown exponentially. Um, and so you see the research dollars growing exponentially. Um, in the US, uh, 100, um, $163 million is allocated by the Department of Defense for suicide-specific research. Our National Institutes of Mental Health uh, allocates about $40 million. So the advent of, of our wars um, in Iraq and Afghanistan has created a military suicide problem, and our military has a tremendous budget. So it's, it is a watershed of funding, um, and these organizations are veterans, hospitals, and the Defar Tar Department of Defense are spending millions on suicide-specific research and care. Um, in my country, there are now uh, increasingly states that are requiring, mandating, that licensed providers get continuing education credit where they're trained in suicide-specific care because they don't typically get trained in graduate school, medical school, nursing programs, and their professional programs. It's bizarre that for the fatalities of mental health, that it, it, in most countries, we don't get curricularly driven suicide-specific training and assessment and treatment. Makes no sense, but there it is. So now we have laws being passed uh, where we're gonna be forced to get trained. And perhaps that's a good thing. I, I'm, I'm against coercion, I'm, get, I'm against mandating anything, but perhaps this is the only way to get clinicians with their head out of the sand to deal with this issue. Um, this is also a, a very exciting movement. Uh, people who have been our patients, lived experience, attempt survivors, are telling their stories of being in treatment, and they're not very positive. And so this is a very vocal movement in the United States of people who've been in treatment, who have been suicidal, who've made attempts, who have been hospitalized, who've been medicated, saying, we don't like the treatment. We don't like being shamed and blamed and treated with such coercion and with no dignity. And they are making an impact, uh, at least in my country. So it's a very interesting uh, movement and it's really garnering a lot of attention. There is um, 
in the U.S. something called the National Action Alliance. I'm on the Clinical Care Task Force, which has led to the zero suicide movement. Has anybody heard of zero suicide? It's coming your way. It's an international movement. Uh, I was just in Australia in March to roll this out in Australia in the Southern Pacific. It's, it's a policy initiative um, that aspires towards this idea that there's never enough, uh, what, what number of suicides would ever be acceptable? Um, I'm not crazy about the name, but here's the thing. In the US, it's now, we now have over 30 states that are developing zero suicide initiatives at the state level. There are international initiatives in the UK, in Ireland, in Australia, um, in uh, Southeast Asia, based on the zero suicide model. If you want to raise the standard of care in a hospital, or in your province, or in your state, or your country, you wouldn't have to start with, from scratch if you follow the zero suicide model. So it's interesting in that way, and I've become a convert to the name because it's changing things. And it's, it's changing policy, and it's changing clinical practices. There's a lot of rhetoric about evidence-based treatments, but they're hardly ever used. Um, so we need to think about that and what's up with that. Uh, there, in the VA system in, the, in my country, in the DOD, evidence-based practices are what people are supposed to do. Hardly any clinicians actually do them. So we can look at that, especially with regard to suicide risk, because, what, because there are effective treatments, but they're rarely used, and we have to think about why that is. Okay. So I come at this as a clinician researcher, which is different than being a research clinician. And what I mean by that is to say, every good research idea I've had has been inspired by my patients. And by encountering a patient where I don't quite know what to do, which has then led to some research that you're gonna see all morning long. If you're a research clinician, you're a researcher for first, and you think about this in a high efficacy kind of way, in a manualized treatment kind of way, and you may have great data, but it may not translate readily into clinical care. And that's a big challenge for our field. How are we gonna save lives clinically if clinicians aren't trained to do things that actually work? So one of the challenges of this field is that there are two very effective treatments for suicide risk with no models for them to be, to be trained. And I'll show you those in a minute. We're not going to save lives if clinicians don't do treatments that actually work. So that's a, that's a big bias that I have. And again, I mean to absolutely impress you um, with the people that I hang out with. But this is Greg Brown, um, who's a contemporary um, working in Beck's lab. This is David Rudd, who I'll be talking about his work, Craig Bryan, um, Marsha, um, and others. So. Um, I, I bring a, a very clinically um, mindful approach to this with the research coming sort of as a, as, not as an afterthought, but as a, as a follow-up to that, that bias. So what I'm talking about is clinical suicidology, which is a specialization within a specialization that you may not have even heard of. But what makes up clinical suicidology are theories and different kinds of assessments for suicidal states independent of diagnosis, treatments that are suicide-specific, professional training, a focus on risk management and process improvement, and then finally, a focus on ethical and legal considerations. Because obviously, you know, people kill themselves all the time. In my country, by the end of the day, 120 people have taken their lives. And 40% of them will be in active treatment with a mental health provider. So clearly, our patients can do this. What I typically say to a suicidal person is, of course you can kill yourself. The question is, is it the best thing to do? And I've got very strong biases about this. Um, my argument to you would be, you have everything to gain and really nothing to lose by engaging in a suicide-specific evidence-based treatment and giving it a go. You could always kill yourself later. We all get to be dead forever. What's your hurry? Now, if you're a suicidal person, plagued with pain, 
and a clinician talk to you, talks to you like that, what do you think? That I don't care? I think the patient thinks you really get what it's like to be me. I think the patient says, you get that I can do whatever I want. I'm an autonomous being. You can lock me up, but you can't keep me there. I can always kill myself. So the big issue with suicide is, have you thought about suicide? Well, yes, I have. Well, you can't do it. Well, who the hell are you? It's my life. I can do what I want. No, you can't. Yes, I can. You want to bet? I do. <laughs> and everything about this engagement is counter-therapeutic. Everything. It's an adversarial battle. So by its nature, suicide pits us against the patient. And in most countries, and in most jurisdictions, licensed providers are required by law to stop someone from killing themselves if they're in clear and imminent danger. The problem is no one knows what clear and imminent danger actually means. And so we get in these power struggles. So of course clinicians get into controlling and shaming and coercion and finger wagging. Right. Is that good for the patient? No. So we want to think about things a little bit differently today. And it's not to be provocative for the sake of being provocative. It's just to make us think, if you're a suicidal person struggling at the precipice of life, not being able to bear another moment, and you see a mental health provider who looks down on you and starts wagging their finger and telling you how you feel, it's probably not going to feel very therapeutic. It's probably going to be a very shaming, invalidating experience. And folks, I'm afraid there's too much of that going on in our mental health care. There's too much coercion. There's too much talking down our noses. There's too much telling the patient how it is that they feel and what it is that they need to do. And so when I get to the CAMS model, we're going to turn that model upside down. Because the patient knows best, not the doctor. The patient knows best about their struggle. And when they give us the honor of moving into their world to share that world of pain and suffering, what do we do with that honor? What do we do with that privilege? Tell them how they feel? No, we should listen to how they feel and validate their experience. That's how you save lives clinically. All right. So to that end, um, we have people who get in very um, dangerous situations. This is a gentleman who's on one of the towers, the Golden Gate Bridge in San Francisco. Uh, if you've ever been to San Francisco, this is a spectacular uh, engineering feat. It's the gateway to the West. Uh, we know exactly how to prevent his suicide. You put a bridge barrier up, and people will not kill themselves. And there's not method substitution. And in San Francisco, bridge barriers have been proposed politically to be voted up or down, and voted down five times. Because it's the Golden Gate. And it would ruin the aesthetics of the beautiful structure. And thousands have plunged to their death. Now, fortunately, there's a law that was passed finally to put up a very elaborate netting system and a little tram that will, that will catch people in that, wrap them up, and run them back to the, the, uh, the start of the bridge. But it will save lives, and that's a good thing. But until then, you've got this very dangerous thing where people can just climb right over this railing, and pretty much those who take this jump or take a dive about you know, 12, 8% survive. Most are absolutely killed on impact. And what you have is a situation where you know, there are first responders and someone engaging this man. But for us, the really critical thing is, what is on this young man's mind? What do you know about him to be true without even telling you anything about him? I'm sorry? He's desperate. He's desperate. He's in pain. He's in pain. He's 
What else? He's struggling. struggling. Would you feel differently if he was like this? He's ambivalent, isn't he? Who said that? This is a picture of ambivalence. This is a picture of someone in a very dangerous position, surrounded by first responders. That's paradoxical. Because in my country, just get a gun, you blow your head off. You know, it's very easy to kill yourself. So his behavior says to me that he's not quite clear that this big, long drop is the thing to do. And he's found himself surrounded by people whose job it is to stop him. It's a metaphor for what clinicians are faced with. Maybe not so dramatic, maybe on occasion this dramatic, but an idea where somebody's in a vulnerable position on the precipice, and we're in a very tricky spot trying to get him to, so to speak, climb back over the bridge. So we'll we'll think about this as we go uh, in the course of today. Now, I said clinical suicidology is made up of theories, and there's a lot of really exciting theory building in this field. One of my favorite theoretical models was developed by Ed Schneidman. It's actually very old, but the beauty of it is that it's moved us out of this obsession with risk factors. Joe Franklin did a study in 2016, a multivariate uh, meta-analysis of 50 years of risk factor research, and basically showed risk factors don't do anything for us, clinically especially. They don't predict higher than chance. There are literally thousands of risk factors. All of your patients have risk factors. What we, what we need as clinicians is to know what risk factors actually do for us. And they don't do a lot for us. But what Ed said was, one way to think about acute risk is people are in profound psychological pain, which he called psych ache, which is different than depression, different than anxiety. It's a suicide-specific kind of, su- kind of psychological pain. A lot of stressors that impinge on one's well-being, and then agitation or perturbation. He loved to make up words. Perturbation, psychological autopsy, psych ache. He loved neologisms. But the beauty of it was it was a perfect storm model that you could think of a highly suicidal person as someone in intolerable pain where unemployment or a hurricane or the loss of a marriage and then dysregulation and extreme agitation and insomnia get this person in a very wickedly dangerous place. And when these psychological forces come together, that's where behavior occurs. So it was the first of the, of the kind of the perfect storm synergistic models like Thomas Joyner's model, his psychosocial model where the largest part of the model is a relational component. Those who love me will be better off without me, perceived burdensomeness. My suicide is a gift to those people. I am such a pain in the ass. I get in trouble. I cause so much suffering. My suicide will be a gift. It would be better off without me. And those who I mean to be attached and connected to, it's thwarted. I'm rejected by those who I mean to be close and attached to. So the biggest part of the model is that those who care for me, I'm a burden to, and those I mean to be attached and connected to have rejected me. And then a little bit more controversial side of the model is what he calls acquired capability. Um, This is the idea that we are supposed to survive from a sociobiological standpoint to get our genes in the next gene pool, we have to live and procreate. So how is it that we move from fearing death to actually desiring death? Well, he argues it's through exposure. It's through attempts, it's through genes, it's through trauma, it's through combat, blood and guts, that exposure to very traumatic events uh, creates a kind of a habituation where we move from fearing death to actually desiring death, a capability to die or take one's own life. And so the confluence here, the, the sort of the, the, the intersection is where behaviors occur. Rory O'Connor comes along, he's a professor at the University of Glasgow, he has a more, little bit more complex model, but sometimes complexity is a good thing because it, it gets to be, uh, it, it's not 
it gets to sort of more nuances of the, of the, of the challenge. He has a motivational, uh, pre-motivational, volitional model where there's biology, there's environment, and there's events. And this is sort of the, 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 the march to suicidal behavior that's moderated by other kinds of key variables. The beauty of this model is that basically each bubble Rory's studying in different specific studies, looking at the relative contribution of each bubble to this outcome. So complexity does certain things for us. It, it gets to more of a nuanced way of thinking about it. It also just makes things more complex. David Rudd, Craig Bryan have a fluid vulnerability model that looks at acute versus chronic risk and emphasizes a focus on warning signs. I'll talk about this a little bit later. Um, but the idea is that there are chronic states that can also become acute. David Klonsky and Lexa May have an ideation to, ac uh, to action framework, what's called the three-step theory. Super hot right now in the US because it's really taking us from thinking about there are lots of people who ideate, right? but how do they get into the behavioral side of things? Um, and we have a collaboration now with Klonsky um, looking at testing basically the first two steps of this model with some of the research that we have at my, in my lab. So when we think about assessment and think about traditional assessments, we probably mostly think about two people in a room with a clinician asking questions of the patient. And the clinician's basically the boss of the patient and asking the questions, and the patient's in a bit more of a passive role. Now, there are better and worse ways to conduct clinical interviews. And one of the groups that's been on this uh, topic for a while has been a, a bunch of white men uh, who got together in Switzerland. Uh, over a, we now have women uh, as part of this conference. Um, but the original group was a, was a group of guys that got together for a series of conferences in Ashi, Switzerland. Um, and now the conferences have moved to Colorado. The Ashi approach is a very different kind of thing. There's an emphasis on narrative. There's an emphasis on qualitative. There's an emphasis on the patient telling their story. And the clinician seeing the world through the patient's eyes. Um, and if you can't make it to, to uh, Colorado for the next conference, which will be in 2019, you can get the book. Um, and the book will describe sort of the main ideas uh, of the model. So it's not that clinical interviewing doesn't work, but there are better and worse ways to do it. Um, and this approach, I think, is unique um, in the field and has garnered some measure of, of interest. The other major approaches, or when I'm saying traditional approaches, are the use of assessment tools. Uh, so this is the scale for suicide ideation. This is Kelly Posner's Columbia scale for uh, um, the Columbia scale. Uh, these scales, uh, there's a lot of them. There are hundreds of scales that have been studied and published and copyrighted. Clinicians could care less. Does anybody here use a scale for suicide risk? There you go. That's the problem. So hundreds of these scales are out there. Nobody uses these scales. You know why? I do, because we studied it. They're too long. They're too off-putting. If you get a scale score of 30 on the hopelessness scale, do you know what that means? Probably not. The biggest thing is that they feel off-putting and that clinicians trust their gut. Right? They do in Norway, they do in the US, they do everywhere. They trust their gut and know that their gut could never be beaten by some actuarial tool that has excellent psychometrics on its validity and reliability because, of course, the clinical interview has so much validity and reliability, right? Actually, no. The, the psychometrics of the clinical interview and clinician gut judgments is terrible. Paul Meal was a professor at the University of Minnesota um, who did a series of studies over decades looking at actuarial assessments versus clinical judgment and guess who won every time? The tools. So in study after study, Professor Meal showed that assessment tools are superior than clinical judgment. But here's the thing. The exception, of course, is us, right? <laughs> we know that that data may be true, but our judgment is going to be better. It's just human nature. 
So I want to think about that. Why does it have to be either or? And in the States, if you use an assessment tool, the risk of being sued for malpractice, which is a major threat in my country, if a patient should kill themselves, has decreased significantly. Plus, it's more data. So I'm going to be an advocate of clinical judgment. I'm fine with you having a gut judgment, but you should augment it with more data. That's in the patient's best interest. That's in your best interest as a provider. So one of my favorite papers in the field, for what it's worth, is a paper published in 1977 by Aaron Beck and Maria Kovacs. And why I loved it so much is that they took on something that is actually not widely studied in the field, which is, goes back to our picture of the guy in the Golden Gate Bridge, ambivalence. You know, by definition, if you're talking to a suicidal person in your consulting room, that they are ambivalent because they're still alive. And so what Beck and Kovacs did a long time ago was publish this paper on what they called the internal struggle hypothesis where they asked the patient on a three-point scale to rate their wish to live and on a three-point scale to rate their wish to die, from zero to a little bit to a lot. And what happens when you subtract a patient's self-report of wish to live from wish to die is that it yields something called a suicide index score. Greg Brown comes along years later and publishes a paper showing that when people have a very high wish to die and a very low wish to live, and you've got 3,000 patients that have come through Beck's lab over the years, and you cross-index those ratings with coroner's records and records from emergency departments, that there are significant odds ratios for people who have high wish to die and a low wish to live in a one-time baseline assessment. Isn't that interesting? And what you've just done now is stratified risk. You've now created three lanes of suicidal people who have more of a wish to live and are more attached to living, suicidal people who are on the, the teeter-totter and struggling, and suicidal people who are attached to dying. And that's what they're going to do, and they don't want to be talked out of it. Do you see this clinically? I, be I bet you do all the time. So here's... The scale for suicide ideation, here's the wish to live, moderate to strong, weak, none, wish to die, none, wild, uh, weak, moderate to strong. It's a simple calculation, wish to live from wish to die, and it renders an interval scale from minus two to plus two. And this is a version of it on a, the suicide status form, which is what my group did. You know, this person's got a four on her wish to live, on his wish to live, and a at eight on wish to die. So they're, they're tipping in that direction, wishing to die. And here's the thing. It's a real thing. We've now had six replications, and I got a new one that I just did in the plane, that shows that reliably, people in a one-time index baseline rating of wish to live, wish to die, can clearly differentiate from, this is the wish to live group, this is the ambivalent group, and this is the wish to die group. This is an inpatient sample at the Mayo Clinic in Minnesota. And why that matters is at the cross-sectional level, they have different responses to standardized measures. Here's the thing. I bet you most people that kill themselves start out as non-suicidal people who start to think about the idea that they could kill themselves. And then over time, they get into the well, I could do it for these reasons, but I wouldn't do that and there. And then I think there's a tipping point where they say, nope, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to kill myself. Don't talk me out of it. It's my solution, and I'm comfortable with it. And that might be what this little geographic space is right here. Can't necessarily say that this is cross-sectional, but I bet you that's what's going on. I just did this yesterday in the plane. We've got a sample of 88 soldiers in our clinical trial, and we've got yet another example. This, need, this table needs some work, but significant differences on different constructs on wish to live, wish to die. It's a thing. 
not all suicidal people are the same. We can measure it quantitatively, and we've done it with six different samples. We can also think about it qualitatively. Okay, so this is the suicide status form. This is a very simple uh, assessment that's completed in the patient's hand in the CAMS model, where the patient, in this case, uh, an inpatient at the Mayo Clinic, is listing their, their reasons for living and their reasons for dying. So five reasons for living and none reasons for dying. This person just came out of the ICU after taking a massive overdose, but has no reasons for dying. This teenager has five reasons for living and five reasons for dying. So she seems kind of in that ambivalent stage. And then this person has five reasons for dying and only one reason for living. It's a very crude way of thinking about the same thing. If you have more reasons for living, you're probably a different person than if you've got more reasons for dying. And when we cross-sectionally look at these data, yep, that's true. On the Beck hopelessness scale, those who have more reasons for living have a lower hopelessness score than those who have more reasons for dying, and the ambivalent group is right smack dab in the middle. Look at the attempt data. Patients who report more reasons for living have fewer one or two attempts. Patients who have um, more reasons for dying have many more two or more attempts. And the ambivalent group is right in the middle. This is a thing. It's a real thing. There's a quantitative way to do it. There's a qualitative way to do it. Suicidal people are different. And it doesn't have to be some complex algorithm. Should they all get the same treatment? Maybe not. Maybe we should be tailoring treatments to different kinds of suicidal states. That's a really important idea, and that's actually a relatively new idea that we're going to talk about before I'm done. Okay. This is a soldier um, at Fort Stewart where we did our, um, this clinical trial. You, you, know, can't, you can't really read this, uh, and that's okay because that, that, it's not really necessary. But, but when they complete the suicide status form in CAMS, they write out different things. His reasons for living, his kids and wife, uh, reasons for to end my pain, uh, ensure soldiers get, I can't quite read it, but the point of this is there's a lot of different things that he's describing as he writes about the phenomenology of a suicidal struggle. This woman starts to repeat herself. Right? Her family, her weight. There's a repetition in the content of what she's writing about. This soldier is very preoccupied. Wife, 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 marriage. So we think of this as a perseverative response, that, that he's very preoccupied with his wife as being sort of the source and focus of a suicidal struggle. And what's interesting about this that we saw in this data set is that when somebody identifies the same thing, the same content, my wife, my job, my unemployment, my kids don't talk to me, my, uh, my disability, four more times, like this kind. So this is, this is the number of kinds of response, you know, are you guys with me? The, the number of times they repeat the same content. We have people that are very heterogeneous in their content, people who start to, to repeat the same thing, and then people who repeat the same thing a lot. The ones who repeat the same thing a lot, in terms of suicidal ideation, are a very different group. In fact, they don't improve in treatment where the ones who have heterogeneity in their responding drop like a rock in terms of ideation. So this is a thing that's called attentional bias. Um, and what's nice about it is that it gets into kind of a ruminative, obsessional kind of process. And when people ruminate, especially suicidal people ruminate, they probably don't sleep very well, so they, be, they develop insomnia. And, and, the, and what Ed Stein used to call this was psychological myopia that instead of seeing the range of things that you could do when you're suffering and struggling, things get sort of whittled down 
into kind of tunnel vision. And what's nice about these data is that it's a behavioral example of, a rumin of rumination. Most studies on rumination are self-reports of people describing how they ruminate. <laughs> and that's about a step or two removed from actually ruminating. Because this guy right here, he, he is definitely ruminating. Now the good news is in CAMS, the first thing we're going to do is we're going to bring in the wife. <laughs> you know, that's the first thing we're going to do. If we can, if we can attack that and save the marriage, or if the marriage is over and he has to grieve the loss of that marriage, that's going to potentially save his life. Um, the other thing we think about is, for people like this, they've lost their cognitive flexibility. They've lost the plasticity. They've lost their ability to think more flexibly. So we're, we're really, you know, does mindfulness get to that? Does ECT get to that? Do we, do we need to think about, like, techniques that uh, geriatric populations are supposed to do to keep their minds and brains flexible. You know, we, we really, we're really concerned about these folks because in a treatment that otherwise works with just about everybody, it doesn't work with these guys. All right. Now, a big obsession in the field of assessment is that when you ask a suicidal person, are you suicidal, they may be and say no, or they may not be and say yes. And there's always this issue of face validity and secondary gain, right? That, that the patient knows what you're asking, why you're asking it, and if they are homeless in Oklahoma and living in the street, that's a way that they get brought in, get food, get shelter, and place to sleep. So there's a lot of reinforcement for saying, I'm going to kill myself, even when the patient has no genuine interest in taking their life. So there's been a lot of excitement about indirect assessments of suicide. This is the Kessler K10. It's a symptom-based assessment developed by Ron Kessler at Harvard. And not a single question on here asks about suicide. But when you do research like we do, you, and you have a lot of psychological assessments and measures of suicidal risk, there's a re particular response profile that is correlated with increased suicidal risk. And boom, there's the paper. So, so we can look at correlations with increased risk without asking directly about suicide. But the king of indirect assessment is this guy, Matt Nock, who developed something called the Implicit Association Test, or the IAT. The IAT is a computer-based administration of a series of stimuli that are presented very quickly at a sub-threshold level. So you can't quite see what it is. It's among a series of slides. And this is the suicide stimulus slide. There's a slide that says, life me, death not me, live. And the thing that's being measured is your response latency. You're supposed to pick one. And people that pick this very quickly are thought to have, and I'm talking about very quickly, as measured in milliseconds, are thought to have an intentional bias towards this topic, even though the patient, the subject, doesn't know what's being assessed. Now, Matt got a MacArthur Genius Award, A, because he's a genius, he really is, and B, because he did this really important study where without patients knowing it, he was able to develop a model to predict future attempt behaviors without the patient knowing what was being assessed. And it's been replicated now three times. So this is an assessment that's computer administered where future attempt behaviors and certain samples can be predicted by the latency or lack of latency of the responses towards the suicide stimulus that they can't quite see. So this opens the door to dysregulation. This opens the door to attentional bias. And there's a lot of neuroscience that I don't know a whole lot about, but I'll pretend like I do, because it's very important in terms of how we think about how the suicidal mind works. And now we have both a modified Stroop test that Matt has done that predicts future behavior. Marianne Goodman comes along, and she now tests eye blink responses. So she puts sensors around the eye, the orbiculus oculi, oculi uh, which are the muscles in, in, our, in all of our eyes that, that respond to stimulus, where we have autonomic you know, blink responses to, to to things that are, uh, that are striking to us. And the paradigm is that you get a tone 
and then a picture. This is a tone that cues you that there's going to be a picture presentation. The picture is either pleasant, neutral, or very upsetting. And if they're counter-ordered and counterbalanced in all these different presentations. But the idea is, if there's a picture that you find distressing, you're going to blink to it, so am I, in a very particular kind of way. So she took a sample of ideators. We're not talking about big numbers. A sample of ideators, single attempters, and multiple attempters. No significant difference for pleasant stimuli. No particular difference for neutral stimuli. But when you get into unpleasant stimulus, look at the multiple tempters. Very significant finding. This is an objective measure of dysregulation, of limbic sensitivity, of reactivity that has been replicated. Okay, so people are responding, and, and the aversive pictures are very aversive. It's a picture of a person like with a gun, and they're wincing just at the moment of, of shooting themselves. Very sort of disturbing pictures, which don't really have an impact on people who don't have this history, but this group seems to be special, and we're going to come back to this. G. Maloney comes along. He's a psychologist that works with the Army. Um, the, the, the Americans in these environments have these night vision goggles that are thermal imagery goggles that give them a huge tactical advantage in, war, in combat environments. GD took that technology, created a paradigm where the, the, the camera is set on the subject's face and their thumb, and a, a clinical interview is conducted. They'll talk about combat. They'll talk about you know, unpleasant things, body parts, traumatic experiences in combat, suicidal thoughts. And when a patient or subject is sensitive to the question that's being asked, basically this happens. The pores on the face, the bridge of the nose, and on their thumb open up in real time and refract to the question that was just asked. So what does that mean? It is yet another marker of autonomic activity, of a sensitivity, and no matter what the patient says, it's kind of a tell. It's kind of a, it kind of reveals a sensitivity to a stimulus, uh, the top, the question at hand, um, in a correlational way that has some measure um, of value. All right. So lots of excitement about technology. Lots of excitement about the idea that we can go so much further than just asking questions. Might there be a day when you shuttle your patient off to a room and they get their eye wired up and a thermal imaging camera turned on and they start doing the IAT to have now three or four, and a modified stroop, to have three or four different objective measures of their attentional bias or their suicidal propensity to then go into clinical interview? It's possible. That's, that's basically the work that Matt Knock does at Harvard. It'd be much more cost efficient. There'd be much more objective data that can further inform your clinical interview. Um, it's definitely coming your way. So with that, we are at our first break. Um, let's pick back up here at 1015.